was Manzanar, which is, well, it's on Highway 395, so you have to go all the way down to to Hatchapi to make a U-turn and come back 395. Yeah. And it's about in the middle of California, but on the other side of the mountain range. Mm -hmm. A pretty desolate area. And it was still being built when most of the people from Southern California were sent there and they recruited the prisoners to become carpenters to build, keep building oh, wow. you know, yeah. the barracks, yeah. which are pretty simple yeah. buildings. There. Mm -hmm. Hardly any floor, hardly any wall, just nail a few two wow, by wow. So the other nine camps were gradually being built. Uh, two or three in Arizona, Utah, Northern California, Idaho, Colorado, and two in Arkansas, way out there. So there were 10 altogether. Uh, some were about 10,000 people. I think Poston had 20,000 or more. Um, so they're, you know, they're scattered all over. And each one pretty much had the same type of building. Uh, army type barracks, except that it was divided into units. So you'd have maybe two, three, or four families living in that one barrack. Wow. Not just one family. So wow. it's really pretty crowded. Crowded condition. No privacy. The walls only went maybe two feet from the ceiling. Wow. So everything is open. Yeah. And, and very little privacy. The latrines, the bathrooms, were just an open room with the toilets lined up. Wow. And quite a shock for, especially the older generation. Sure. The kids can handle it, you know. Right. And, so there's no privacy at no all. No privacy at all. Yeah. Shower is the same way. Open room, but the shower is just wide open. You know, really traumatic for a lot of people yeah. to have to start in the condition. But they're prisoners. Right. What can they do? True. Yeah. True. But anyway, um, that's how the evacuation started. Now, I think there are, there's some information there about the other camps that were Department of Justice camps. Mm. There were maybe 30 of those scattered throughout the country. And what Not were those? that big. But my father-in-law was in one in Bismarck, North Dakota, probably only about 300 men. Now, this is where, starting on December 7, the FBI started rounding up the, what we call the Issei, that's our father, our, the older generation men. And in those days, the men did all the business. They did the, the well, they did the financial work, the, they took care of business. The mother, the wife, in almost every case was just a housewife, raising the children. So. When they took away the leaders who were teachers, doctors, businessmen, whoever, leaders of the community, that left all of these families with just the mother and a bunch of kids with no knowledge of financial or where to buy groceries, where to get the money, had no, you know, never did any of that. Probably never drove a car. So when that happened, it left that population helpless. That's how, in about April of 1942, they were able to tell these people, pack up just what you can carry, go to the curb, and a bus will pick you up and take you someplace. Everybody obeyed, very orderly. The leaders were gone. They were imprisoned in the Department of Justice camps scattered throughout the country. Wow. And there's one very infamous camp that even I didn't know about until I saw a program on 2020. Yeah. Probably around 1960, maybe, okay. somewhere in there. And I was watching that program, and all of a sudden, you know, they have like five or ten minute segments. Yeah. And the same thing, a, a camp in Crystal City, Texas, 
And then it described that it was Japanese ancestry people from the United States, one section, and the other three sections were a German camp, an Italian camp, small numbers, and then another camp was Latin Japanese American, South American. Well, you know, the big rumor in these major concentration camps are that now that we have all the Japanese rounded up, let's ship them to Japan. Wow. People on the West Coast say, yes, let's get rid of them, ship them to Japan. That's terrible. But two thirds or more were American citizens. Mm -hmm. So then they question, how can we send American citizens? So what they wanted to do was to trade us for American prisoners of Japan that were captured in Southeast Asia, really? Philippines, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there were maybe thousands of those people, mostly civilians, but they're American. So they wanted to negotiate a trade. Well then, they put a halt to this sending Americans out. So they sent, and I think it was, it might have been General Marshall, but they negotiated with the countries in South America and Central America to literally kidnap overnight families, even babies that were just a week old. Many of them perished because when they kidnapped the people, it was the same thing. Just grab what you can carry. You have to leave everything. Maybe they were given 24 hours. Wow. It was like immediately, and they shipped them by boat to Texas and then brought them into this Crystal City campus. I think it's located in the southwest district of Texas. I'm not sure, but it's a remote area. So he had all these different nationalities in there. Well, almost all the Germans were sent to Germany in exchange for American prisoners of war. And that program ran a real listing of all these German names, quite a few uh, Jewish names. You can imagine what happened to the Jewish people yeah. when they were sent to Germany. Yeah, wow, wow. And then they were shipping the Japanese from South America, from Te Personal City, Texas, to Japan for exchange with American prisoners of war. Wow. I mean, how can you do things exactly. like that? But that, out of about four or five hundred, I think there were only maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty in left when the war ended. Wow. So they cut off this exchange program. And almost every one of those remaining, they were told, you have to get out because you're here illegally. Wow. Of course, the government had taken every bit of identification, uh, passports, whatever, they had taken everything away from them. Most of them didn't speak English. They spoke Spanish or Japanese. They didn't know what to do. And there was a lifesaver. You might have heard of Seabrook Farms in New Jersey. It was a very large food processing firm. And of course, because of the war, they had no labor. And they found out that there are all these people from South America had to be evacuated out of Crystal City, Texas. And they invited them to come and work. Of course, they slave labor wages, but it was someplace to go and someplace to live. So quite a few went to, and in fact, moved to New Jersey and started working there. So uh, they had a terrible time. Here they're kidnapped, brought to the United States, and now they're told to get out there on their own. Wow. No help from the government. Wow. So there was quite a few lawsuits later, um, and most of them were turned down by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Really bad decisions. Yeah, yeah. And I think almost every one of them. I think what the object was, keep putting it off and eventually they'll all die. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what has happened.
Oh, That's a story that hardly anybody knows yeah, about. Yeah, I was going to say, I had not heard yeah. of that. Wow. But oh. we have a little bit about that here. Okay, okay, but, good, good. Wow. And then I understand.